Neighbor? Neighbor? Hi, neighbor. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> You can go ahead and take a seat for me. Take a seat. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jordan Medina. I have the amazing honor and privilege of being the youth minister here at Third Coast Church. But after tonight, I'll be able to say youth pastor, which is pretty exciting to me. Um, that's the thing they make fun of me the most. Like I say youth pastor, like minister, and I'm like, all right, leave me alone. Um, but I'm uh, mainly ding. Um, but I'm getting uh, ordained tonight, so if anybody wants to be a part of that, you're more than welcome to join. This is going to be a very awesome, special time for me, and I just love the church that uh, I get to serve would be supportive of that. So if you're interested in that, it starts tonight at 6 p.m. Please join us. Um, if this is your first time here with us, we are so, so thankful that you are here. Uh, we have a, a slide up here that says connect with us. If you would scan that QR code and just let us know who you are, how you came to know about Third Coast, and how we could connect with you, we would love to just reach out to you and thank you for choosing us this morning. I say this a lot. There are many places you can be on a Sunday morning. We are so thankful that you are here with us. Um, this uh, month, we've been focusing on spotlighting volunteers, so where you can volunteer here at Third Coast Church, and uh, today, we're going to talk about youth, because that's where I get to serve, and I love getting to do what I get to do. Uh, we have a Sunday school that's going on right now this morning for 6th through 12th graders, so if anybody's in 6th 12th grade who wants to come and join us, please, you can come and join us. It's not too late. Uh, it's a great time. This is a new thing that we're doing, so we're very, very excited about that. And then we also have, we meet on Wednesday nights from 6 to 8 p.m. on every single Wednesday, and... Um, we have some amazing students who just are looking to be poured into, looking for people who they can set an example, who can set an example for them and help guide them through uh, their middle school and high school years. And, you know, I love what I get to do, but it sometimes gets hard to do when it's just you and you're on your own. So if you have any interest in serving in youth, please come find me afterwards or please uh, sign up on the iPad in the back. And if you have any questions about youth, uh, the question is, yes, they are crazy. And, yes, they will ask you a million questions. And sometimes they will not listen no matter how many times you tell them, hey, knock it off, hey, cut it out. But but they're great and they're awesome and I love them. So if you have any interest in that, please come find me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about that. Um, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to get back into worship. Dearly Father, I'm so thankful for this time that we have just to come together and to sing praises to your name, Father. God, I pray during this time we would not <clears throat> let it just fly past us and let us just be another moment. But allow us to take some time to truly sing these songs to you, Father, and thank you for who you are and what you have done and what you're going to do and all in between, Father. Let us just lift our voices to you today. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Let's stay in church. Wide open in our hands 
give this time of worship to you. And we just ask that you will always, that we will always have our eyes fixed upon you. And we are so thankful for every gracious ounce of you. We sing this out for one true king. All the glory and honor. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name. Let's declare that again, church. All of, all of the glory. take oh, have just a little bit of honor to you we're so grateful we'll sing oh Christ be the center of our lives oh Christ be the center of our lives be the place we fix our eyes be the center center of the universe. You're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you. Jesus, breath of every living thing. Everything was made for you. He holds everything. You hold everything together. You hold everything together Oh Christ Be the center of our lives Be the place we fix our eyes Be the center of our lives We sing, Oh Christ Oh Christ Be the center of Fix our eyes, be the 
attention, they're loud, they're noisy. God, every single day we have so many temptations to uh, divert our attention, our focus, our eyes away from you. And so as we sang this morning, as we prepare to open up your word, God, may we remember that our eyes can be fixed on you. And all of those other things that seem like they need our constant attention, all of those other things that seem like they need our constant anger and, and our frustration and online reading and just everything else that seems to to captivate us. God, as we focus on you, all of those things will grow dim as we recognize the one true light, the source from which all other things derive their life, their meaning, their purpose. God, you. And so today, may we practice even for just these few moments, 
setting aside all of those things, all of the things that we came in feeling like we're carrying. God, we're just going to put those aside for a moment and we're going to fix our eyes on you and trust that you'll take care of all of those other things. And we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. My friends, you can have a seat. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Third Coast Church. So good to see all of y'all today. Glad to be here with you. My name is Chris Stapper, and I'm the lead pastor here. If you came last week for the first time, I was not here. Uh, Jordan was actually preaching, and uh, that's because I was serving over in kids uh, and got to hang out with all of y'all's kids, and they told me secrets about your family. So I've got dirt on all of y'all now. It's very easy. You hold out the goldfish, and you're like, but tell me one thing that your parents wouldn't want you to tell me. And they're like, I just want the goldfish, man. And they just, they spill all the beans right there. No, I loved it. It was so much fun hanging out over there. And, and I really, I invite y'all, we've been talking about joining teams over the last few weeks. And whether it's in kids, though, I think that's a great place to serve. Whether it's in youth, which is also a great place to serve. Our hospitality team, and another excellent place to serve any of these things. Let me tell you what happens when you go and do that. Because it stresses all of us out before we do it, right? Like you're driving over here and you're thinking, am I going to be able to control these kids? Am I, are things going to get wild? Am I going to know what to say? Am I going to be able to make the coffee? Am I going to be able to do all of these things? But here's what happens as you drive away after doing those things. You are reminded of how God has equipped you and gifted you, and you have the pleasure not of, man, what a great job I just did, but you have that joy of sensing God's pleasure in you as you serve and you share the gospel with other people. And so all like being in here, I'm glad we get to worship together, but friends, you're always going to be missing out if you're not also serving and using the gifts that God has given you. And so we are inviting you, come join a team. We will train you. We'll equip you. We'll find some ways that you can uh, slowly ease your way into kids ministry or youth ministry or our hospitality team or worship production whatever it might be, but we want you to be a part of serving. There are so many good opportunities we have to share the gospel in all kinds of creative ways. So I'll meet you in the lobby afterwards and tell you all about that. And if that does not seal the deal, we also have really great shirts and we'll give you any of those shirts. Okay. So if you want a third coast shirt, all you have to do is come serve and we will give you one of those. Sound like a deal? Yeah, of course. Shirts are the currency of third coast church and we're happy to give them away. So if you have your Bible, open it up to first Samuel chapter seven. That's where we're going to be together as a church this morning. We're continuing on in our series called Threads of Faith. And so we are going to be picking up that story in a few minutes. And I was thinking this week about um, how I learned to ride a bicycle. Did, did any of y'all have kind of terrifying bicycle riding learning stories? Like, does anybody have like a crash that you remember? Like, I, I learned how to ride the way probably a lot of y'all uh, learned how to ride a bicycle, which was my parents lied to me. And they lied to you probably too. And here's what I mean is that my dad would like hold me, right? Or, and then he got to where he was holding the seat. And then at some point I was like, dad, do you got me? And his voice was way behind me and he had just let go of the seat, right? Which now caused me to look behind me, which is no way to ride a bicycle. And so then I would crash and all I associated in my young brain was dad lies, my knee gets scraped up, right? Like that's how I learned to ride a bicycle. And uh, maybe you have that same experience. So I was determined that when my kids got old enough to learn how to ride a bicycle, I was not going to do that. I was going to come up with some better way. I knew there had to be a better way to learn to ride a bicycle. And it turns out there is, there is an easy way to teach a kid to learn to ride a bicycle. And I taught my kids how to ride this way. And I got so good at it that I actually, in our place that we used to live, I would teach like our neighbors and other people from the church, like how to, like their kids could ride a bicycle. If you give me an hour with a kid and some cones on a tennis court, like I promise I can teach them how to ride a bicycle and it's super easy. All you have to do is take the pedals off of the bike and get them to scoot around and learn how to balance. Like it's a whole system. We can talk about it after this, but it is so easy. All the kids that I would work with, like so simple and I loved it. It was a lot of fun. And perhaps because I was so good at that when they were children is why Aaron said, I think you should be the one to teach them to drive a car. I don't know if there was like a connection between those things, but somehow or another, when our kids got to be 15, 16, 17, I became the default driver's ed teacher. 
Now I need to say, that's kind of crazy because I'm not always the most peaceful person while I drive, right? Like as I'm driving, if somebody like pulls in front of me, it's not just that they saw a space and could go. I take that as a personal offense, right? Like I'm like, I don't know why they think they're better than me and they should have that space in front of me. I don't want to feel that way. I'm not like bragging about that. That's just who I am. Driving is a stressful experience for me, constant competition. I don't like it. And you would never think that somehow I would be the one to then teach our our children how to drive except that's what happened I had to teach the kids how to drive and I got to tell you there's a big difference between teaching a child to ride a bike and teaching a child how to drive a car right like huge huge difference and I don't just mean in the mechanics I mean my investment in the process was wildly different between teaching them how to ride a bike and teaching them how to drive a car namely I had to sit in the car while they drove I didn't have to ride the bicycle with them, right? Like as I was teaching them to ride the bicycle, if they fell, I was sad, right? Mostly. I was like, oh, sad. That's terrible. If they crashed while we're in the car, different level of investment entirely, right? Like completely different scenario. And so to teach a kid to ride a bike, I was interested in that. I had fun doing that. I wanted them to succeed. I wanted them to do well. But if they didn't, it's like, well, we'll try again tomorrow. But when I went and sat in the passenger seat and my child had the wheel and had to learn how to do this, I wanted them to succeed, not just because of the accomplishment, but because I wanted to live, right? Like I wanted them to succeed at this because I had a different level of commitment. Now, it's not just that I was committed. It's not just that I was interested. It's not any of those things. Really, in these experiences, in one scenario, I had to trust. And in another scenario, I didn't, right? In one scenario, I had to put all of my trust that they were going to know how to operate the vehicle, that they would follow my instructions. When I told them that they could go or speed up or slow down, or they needed to make more room, that they were going to follow those instructions. And I had to trust that they would be able to take all of their coordination and somehow keep my life safe. I had to trust them. Riding a bicycle, I mean, I wanted them to do well, but my life wasn't on the line didn't require any trust for them to learn how to ride a bike. But to teach them to drive, I had to trust them because I had to put myself in the space where my life was literally on the line. Trust is an incredible commitment. It is a big, big thing to say that we trust somebody. And sometimes we throw that around pretty lightly, but deep down, when we talk about trust, trust is one of the biggest commitments we can make with our whole life. And it's why throughout the scripture, what we see over and over again in some way, shape or form, trust is the central issue of the story of the Bible trust. Are we going to have faith? Are we going to put our trust in? Is our confidence going to be found in God? Are we going to trust God when everything is on the line? It's easy to sort of treat it the way I did teaching the kids to ride a bicycle. I'm interested in what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, I I think that's a good thing, but it's a whole other thing to say, I'm actually going to put my life in the hands of God. I'm going to trust him that he knows what's best for me and that he can be in absolute control of my life. And as we pick up our story today of Samuel, what we're going to see is Samuel is going to call the people to a moment of trust and commitment. He is going to put that choice in front of them to trust the Lord with all of their heart. Now, as we prepare to read this story, we have talked a little bit about Samuel thus far, and um, we've talked about his incredible birth story with uh, his mom, Hannah, uh, a few weeks ago, and and we discussed that and and this miracle, and she gives him to the temple, and we also learned about Eli, who was the priest at that point, and we learned about his sons, and we found out that they weren't very good guys, but they were running the religious life of the Israelites at that time. And in the chapters between where we uh, left last week where Jordan talked to you about Samuel's call and this week some things happen and the nation of Israel gets attacked by this group the Philistines and the Philistines come and they overrun the Israelites and this is what we read in chapter 4 verses 10 and 11 it says that the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home 
And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So we had Eli, this old priest who nobody was listening to. He had given over power to his sons. His sons were evil guys. They didn't follow the Lord, and, and the Bible calls them worthless scoundrels. Like, like, these are not good guys. And so they lead the people into battle, and they die in battle. But not just they died. Something else happens in the story. The ark of God was captured. It's not a real picture of the ark. In fact, we don't know where the ark is. Some people think it's in Ethiopia. Some people think it got destroyed. We're not really sure where it is, but this is essentially what the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of God, would have looked like. And Hebrews tells us that in that Ark, there were a couple of things. They contained a jar of manna that they had in the desert when they were leaving Exodus. It had one of Aaron's staffs that they used for the miracles when they were uh, competing against Pharaoh and, and asking Pharaoh to release all the people. And then it also had the stone tablets of the covenant that that God had written and given to the people. All of those things were contained in the ark. And for people who were taking possession of the land and they didn't yet have a temple, this ark became a symbol of what God had done. It was a physical reminder of this covenant relationship that God had provided for them, that God had rescued them, and that God had called them to obey it. And in some instances, though, it became just kind of like a rabbit's foot or some lucky charm that they would bring out. And that's what we we see in this story is Hophni and Phinehas, they're not really God's people. They don't really follow God and they're losing this battle. So they're like, well, bring out the ark and that's surely going to help us. And they bring it out and it turns out that they still lose and the ark of the covenant is captured. Now, this is a just kind of a fun story. You ought to go back and read 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6 sometime because some crazy things happen in the land of the Philistines when they capture the ark. They're so happy that they've taken this and they think it's nothing. It's just this box. And so they go and put it in one of their temples and then they wake up the next morning and their God, who's a statue, has fallen over. And they're like, well, that's kind of crazy. And so they stand it back up and then they come back the next day and the statue's fallen over again. Only this time his hands and his head are cut off. And they're like, that's not normal. Something else is like going on here. And the longer they keep the ark, bad things start happening to them over and over. They're getting like these boils and terrible things and they realize we should never have taken this thing at all. And so the Philistines end up sending it back to Israel. They're like, we do not want this. Get it out of here. We want to be rid of this thing. And they send it back. And the people of Israel are actually kind of nervous to get it back as well. And when we pick up in chapter 7, these first few verses are actually telling us what happens with the ark. That it goes to somebody's house and they just kind of quarantine it there at some house on the hill and they consecrate this guy and they're like, um, you do it. Like, you just watch this thing. We don't really know what else to do. The ark takes on this legendary, incredible uh, status in there in this moment where the people have been defeated. It's returned from the land and they don't exactly know what to do with it. All of that happens but it tells us that the Philistines continue to rule over the Israelites for a long time, for about 20 years. So recapping the story, Samuel is born. He's given to the temple, the priest, Eli. Nobody's listening to him. His sons are evil men. They die in battle. And for this period of two decades, the people are under oppression from an outside group and they're crying out to the Lord. And during that time, Samuel is growing in stature amongst the people. And it's right then that we pick up our story for today in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. And Samuel stands up in front of the people, and this is what he says. If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreth and they served the Lord only. This is the word of God for the people of God. This is an incredible moment in the life of Israel, and it's so short that it's easy to just kind of rush past it and say, okay, but what happens next? What's the rest of the story? But I want to pause and really consider what Samuel is asking them in this question. 
Samuel has now grown up into a noted priest. He's been serving in not their temple, but their, their, their synagogue, their tabernacle, their, their place of worship. He would have been known. And on this day, after two decades of living under foreign oppression, Samuel gathers the people of Israel, people who have been lamenting to God, why has this happened? Why have we lived in such disobedience? Why is it that somebody else is ruling over us? And he lines them up and he presents to them a choice. And he essentially says, you can go one way or you can go the other, but it is time to choose. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to choose the way of all of these gods around us? Are you going to choose the way of the, the people that we see around us? Are you going to choose the way of disobedience? Or are you going to choose to honor the covenant relationship that you have with God? We talked about the Ark of the Covenant. We see covenant throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, this idea of a covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two people about how they are going to behave in the future. When you make a covenant agreement, you're not just saying, this is how I feel right now. You're saying, this is how I'm going to behave in the future, even when times are difficult. And God had made a covenant with his people. He said, I am rescuing you, and in the future, you you are to respond with trust and obedience. Now, trust and obedience are easy when times are good, but trust and obedience are required when times are difficult. And God is saying, look to this moment. I have rescued you. I've brought you out. That's why we're going to have this, this ark that will hold these things that you can remember what I've done because in the future, there are going to be difficult moments. And that's when I need you to trust and obey me. And Samuel says, listen, you've got a choice. Are you, are you going to live as the people around us and worship their gods? Are you going to honor your covenant with God? What are you going to do? Are you going to trust him or not? Are you going to give him your confidence and your faith or not? And Samuel lays out two things that they need to do if they want to honor their covenant relationship. This two-step process. On the one hand, there's a negative action. He says, I need you to turn from your other gods. And then there's a positive. And then return to the Lord. See, there's a negative. I turn from this in order that I can turn to another thing. Sometimes in our own battle of, of waging against sin and following after God, sometimes we get so focused just on the negative action. I don't want to do this that we forget the positive action of returning to the Lord, but it's, it's both things. Samuel says you've got to turn away from this and turn to God. But in turning away from other gods, what Samuel is really saying is there's no backup plan. Like, that, I don't want you hedging your bets. Like, it's, you don't get to trust God and trust these other things. And this is one of those cultural things that I think is so hard for us to understand about the Old Testament people. Because we read that they've got these other gods and we just think, that's ridiculous. Like, why would you have that? You should just worship God alone. And, and we don't quite understand how they could have statues and figurines and things like that. And we're like, that just seems silly to us. But for those people... When their lives depended on the rain showing up in their fields and producing a crop, and you see season after season, and it's like, well, we got a little bit of rain last year, but, but it doesn't seem like we're getting any rain this year. There's this temptation. Listen, I know God's going to provide, but does it really hurt if I also maybe go to this other thing over here? I mean, what if I just, I mean, said Baal as well and put like a little statue in my house? I mean, is that really that bad to have had that thing as well? I mean, it can't hurt, right? You see, the people weren't trying to be this polytheistic people. They weren't making some philosophical decision. Their survival was on the line. And so in their minds, it was just, I'm going to do whatever I can that is going to make sure that my family can eat, that we can be provided for, and that our family can continue. That's why they would have these other gods. But Samuel says, no, you have to turn from those other gods and you have to return to the Lord. See, this statement is a summons to look only to Yahweh, only to their God in every need and circumstance. Samuel isn't saying, listen, just on the big things, that's where you trust God. But on your daily life, you kind of do whatever you want. Samuel is saying, 
in every circumstance, every need of your life, the big to the small, trust in God. Honor your covenant relationship. Put away those foreign gods. Get rid of them and return to God, he says, with your whole heart. With your whole heart. For us, we, we kind of have separated body parts into maybe different feelings or different emotions or different ways of going about, right? Like if I said, hey, I'm going to put my mind to that, we're really talking about I'm going to think hard on that, right? Like, like if I'm putting my mind to something, that's, that's like all of my intellect and every bit of my intelligence. That's what I'm going to think about. And if we said, you know what, I just feel it in my gut, what are we talking about? I just ate a Taco Bell. No, like it's, I, uh, I, I had this instinct, right? Like I, I, I just feel it. There's some intuition, right? And if you say, but, but man, that really stirred my heart. We're talking about our emotions. We got to separate mind and instincts and, and our emotions. We kind of separate all of those. But for the Israelites to say with all of your heart encompassed all of those things. For them, the heart was the center of their being. It, it encompassed everything, all of those, their, their, their thoughts, their feelings, their, those gut responses, those instincts, everything was centered in the heart. And what Samuel is saying, return to the Lord with all of your heart is saying with complete commitment. This is not a halfway measure. Trust God with your whole entire self, every aspect. Do you see the complete binary choice that Samuel is presenting? There's no middle ground for them. It's not like, well, we can kind of do this 90% of the way. His question is, are you going to trust God or not? And if you trust, that trust needs to be total and absolute. And it says that the people responded and they put away their other gods and they served the Lord only. And then to commemorate this decision, the people gather together and they go through this ceremony to recognize this moment of rededicating, of repentance, of turning back towards God. And it's right in the middle of that that the action picks up. In verse 7, it says that when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So we have the whole nation of Israel. They're gathered together. Samuel gives them this choice. They say, we're going to trust in God. They put away their gods. They say, well, now let's gather up. Let's have this big worship moment where we're going to rededicate our lives. And it's at that exact moment that the Philistines decide we're going to attack the people. When they're in this spiritual gathering, not a military gathering. And, and there's maybe several different reasons for that. Perhaps the Philistines just didn't want any gathering happening. But one scholar said, this is the moment where Israel looks more vulnerable than at any other point. They're in the middle of worship. They're not planning. They're not scheming. They don't have their generals out figuring out the best battle plans or anything like that. This is the moment where they would be the most easily crushed because they are all together in this worship moment. But what the Philistines don't know is that while Israel may look their most vulnerable, this is actually when they are at their greatest strength. This is the paradox of trust in God for many of us, is that trust can often make us look vulnerable, but when we place our trust completely and wholly in God, this is when we have our greatest strength. We may look vulnerable to the outside world, but this is when we have our greatest strength. And the Israelites gather up together and the Philistines decide to attack them. And what we see happen in the next few verses is that the Philistines were not actually the enemy that Israel had to face. We see that while they are attacking them and there is a battle that's about to break out, the real battle of this story was not between the Israelites and the Philistines. The real battle in this story was in the hearts of the Israelites. You see, there was a battle that happened long before this attack from the Philistines. Like long before they saw them gathering up and they gathered up their generals and they went and attacked them, there was already a battle that had taken place. And that battle was in the hearts of the Israelites. Were they going to trust God or not? And what happens is that the circumstances, the attack of the Philistines just brings that real issue to light. Because the greatest issue facing the Israelites is God's people was the question, who will you trust when your life is on the line? 
when it seems like there's no way forward, when it seems like everything is closing in around you, when it seems like you can't provide for yourself, when it seems like things are beyond your control, who are you going to trust when your entire life is on the line? The Philistine battle was only the circumstance that brought this real issue to light. The people had dedicated themselves. They had made this pledge. They had put away their gods. But this is the moment when their trust was really going to be put to the test. Who would they trust when it was all on the line? And so the people, they cry out to Samuel in verse 8, or verse 7, it says, or 8, excuse me. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and he offered his a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel and the Lord answered him. They are crying out. This idea is more than a simple prayer. I mean, there's the kinds of prayers that we pray and, and they're the prayers before a meal and it's, thank you God for this. They're the, they're the simple prayers. There's nothing wrong with those prayers, but that is different than what we see the people asking for here. They're saying, Samuel, will you cry out for us? To cry out is more than simply just voicing some request. To cry out is to completely relinquish control to God. It is a moment of absolute desperation, of recognizing there is nothing I can do on my own. I cry out to you, God. I give all of my control, every bit of my life to you. And I wonder, do you have a moment in your life where you have cried out to God with that kind of desperation? And I can think about a situation where I sat and I prayed, and I remember saying these words, God... It is impossible for us to move forward. As I was praying for my family, I just, I remember praying those words. I said, it is not possible. There is no way this can happen. And what I was really saying is in my power, there, like I could not make these things happen. It wasn't a question of energy. It wasn't a question of intellect. Like where I wanted us to be, where I felt like we were being called to be, th there's just no way it could happen. God, it's impossible. And I remember praying and just saying, they, there's nothing I can do. God, I, the only way this could happen would be if you did something. There, I have no control over the situation. God, you alone are going to have to make this happen. You alone are in control. That's what the people ask. Samuel, we, we recognize we can't do this. We've tried before. We've already lost the battle. The ark was already captured. It, that's not the question here. The question is, are we going to be able to trust God? Lyle helping us out with the cry out idea. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, like that. Lyle's given up all control. Mom, help me out. And God responds. And God responds with this thunder that puts the Philistines into panic. And they scatter. And in verse 10, we see that the Israelites basically do this mop-up duty. Uh, they, they show up and they're, they're able to chase off the Philistines. And it starts this moment of peace for the people where God's hand protects them. And over the next few years, it says that the Philistines uh, are, are gone and that the Israelites reclaim their territory that had been relinquished to the Philistines. All because they put their trust in God and they cried out. See, the moment when they looked their weakest, the moment when they had given up trusting in their own power was the moment when God acts in their story. And so Samuel, he puts up in verse 12, says that he takes the stone and he sets it up between Mizpah and Shin, and he called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer is Hebrew words, which just literally mean stone of help. It's, it's this idea that we could look to this thing, this place that we were at, and we can remember forever and always that, that this was not our victory. That when we tell the story and the legend grows, and maybe a few years down the road, somebody's like, well, really, I mean, it was a good general. And, and they could say, no, 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 no. Remember the Ebenezer. Because we put that up to remember that this was the Lord's victory. 
victory, not our victory. We didn't do this. This was not something that we just finally like had a great idea. No, God rescued us because we put our trust in him because we cried out to him because we gave up trying to be in control and instead trusted that God would be in control. That's what that stone means. It is a marker for them. The Ebenezer Samuel puts up an Ebenezer and says, this reminds us that up to this point, God has helped us. And then it says in verse 15 that Samuel judged Israel for all the days of their life. Which serving as a judge, he would go around and he would call them back to faithfulness in God. When they were getting a little off course, he would remember or help them remember and, and return to the path and repent in their lives and go back to following God. And he did this. He had this circuit. He would go from one city to the next to the next. And he was just constantly calling them back to faithfulness. And what we see here at the end of the story is that that first victory against the Philistines was really just preparing them for the daily work of their covenant relationship. That God hadn't just made a covenant with them so he could deliver them in the big moments like that battle with the Philistines. No, that God had made this relationship with them because he wanted them to live in obedience and trust every single day. And for the rest of Samuel's life, this is what happens. And it happens because they could look back and remember God rescued us in that important moment. And so even when the days were difficult and even when they didn't feel like trusting, they could say, but we remember God rescued us in that moment. And so we can trust him today. We can put our trust in him. And Samuel does this for the rest of his life. And this is one of the high watermarks in the entire nation of Israel right here. It's like this is the moment when they've gotten it so wrong so many other times. And this is a moment when as a nation, they get it right. They understand that God will provide for us. And that we're called to put our trust in him, that we're called to give up our control and instead trust that he is going to be our provider. It's an incredible moment. And there's a few things in the story that I think that we can remember for us today. While we're not the exact same as the Israelites, our circumstances are certainly different. I think there's some things in the story that certainly we can remember in our life as well. First thing is this, that when we practice absolute trust, we may look foolish to an unbelieving world. You know, if the fundamental question of scripture, one of the, the overriding questions that we see throughout the scripture is, who will we trust we need to acknowledge that there are times when we put our trust in God, but it makes us look foolish to other people. I can picture this scenario where they're gathering up for worship and they're gathering up to rededicate their lives. And somebody probably noticed that the Philistines were approaching. And at that moment, they're like, hey, guys, we need to wrap up the singing because we've got real problems, right? Like there's other things coming and, and this is all fine and good, but we need to actually attend to the problem. And if somebody had tried to stop the singing, you know what Samuel would have done? No, no, no. This is how we're preparing. This is the way that we are going to be prepared for that out there. There are times when we may think it is foolish to be completely trusting in God. I need to actually prepare. I need to face the problem. I need to do all of these other things because that's what a good, realistic person does. A pragmatic person is going to look at those problems and try and address them. But scripture reminds us over and over and over again to trust God in every need and every circumstance. And it may look, make us look foolish sometimes. Second thing is that our battle, the battle that we face, just like the battle was not really between the Israelites and the Philistines, the battles that we so often want to fight are not the right battles. They're not the right battles. The battle that we face over and over is, are we going to trust or not? The battle is against the temptations that would lead us to trust. But, but it's so much easier to be mad at things that we see online or mad that, about things we read in the news or mad about things on TV or mad about like issues and other, like it's so much easier to be mad at those things. But those are just the circumstances that bring the real battle to light. And the battle that we face as God's people is constantly, are we going to trust him or not? Are we going to give in to the temptation to maybe just hedge our bets a little bit? I know God's going to provide, but I also think that this issue, I mean, I should, I should probably keep that close to my heart as well. 
God has not asked us for halfway trust. He has asked us for complete and utter trust, commitment and giving him control over our lives. That's what it means for him to be our Lord. And finally, when trust is hard, we can remember how the Lord has helped us. Maybe you've heard that word before, Ebenezer, right? Uh, You've heard it, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, maybe. Like that's uh, one thing uh, that I always think about. But um, maybe you've sang a song about it. In fact, we're going to sing a song in just a moment that talks about raising up an Ebenezer. And I don't know what the Ebenezers would be for you. I don't know what you might think in your life is that thing that helps you remember God's faithfulness in your life. But when trust is hard... What is the thing that you can look to? I'm going to ask Eric to come up, and I'm going to tell you about one Ebenezer, and I'm holding it right here. Um, if you were here last week, uh, Phil and Catherine uh, presented us with a gift, and it was on behalf of you guys, and I really appreciated that. It meant more to us than you would know, um, and read all the notes, and they just loved them. Um, but one of the things that, that was in that box was this Bible, and I already had a Bible, but I felt bad telling them that. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I... Uh, This Bible is for me one of those things. Um, And I say that because our church is in a bit of a transition moment right now. Like there's some times when not really sure what the future is going to look like exactly. I mean, we've got some big questions and things we chat about as a staff, and maybe you've even been talking about, like, how are we going to fit, and what are, what are things going to do, and there's all these new people, and it's a really exciting moment. And my goodness, everything in me wants to control this situation and get like figure out the solution so y'all will say man chris is so smart like he's got this great idea wow chris is incredible and i feel that temptation over and over and over again and i've had to remember throughout this that this transition moment is really just an opportunity for us to practice this kind of trust that samuel was talking about Somehow or another, God is going to provide. And I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't have some idea and I'm just waiting to, to unleash it on you guys or anything like that. There's no strategic decision. It, it actually kind of makes me look foolish sometimes. People will ask me, they're like, well, what are y'all going to do? And I'm like, I really don't know. And I can sense them thinking, you're a terrible leader. Like that's, a, that's what I feel like they're saying. It makes me look and feel a little bit foolish. And yet deep down, I feel like I am learning to trust God in a way that I never have before. And I hope that you're experiencing that as well. And so for me, getting this Bible in the middle of all of this that's going on, I think this is going to be one of those things that I can look back on and say, man, I remember when the church gave me that Bible. It was like in one of the most difficult moments when trust was low, right? Where, where it just, it was at its low point. It just was growing and growing and it was just learning how to trust. And I'll be able to look back at this and remember God's faithfulness in whatever way God is going to provide for us. And I wonder for you, what is that Ebenezer? What is the thing you can look back to? How is God provided? Where can you look back and say, that is an example of God's faithfulness? Samuel does this, and it doesn't set up a precedent where we're supposed to do this for the rest of our lives. And yet, over and over, the scripture points out markers of faithfulness. And so today, as we sing this song about raising up an Ebenezer, I want to encourage you to jot down a moment of God's faithfulness. Like, grab your phone, write in your Bible, write it down somewhere. But, like, don't leave here today without acknowledging, you know what? If nothing else, I remember that's where God moved and that's where God was faithful and that's where God provided and I need that on some days when it's a little hard to remember and I feel like I want to hedge my bets just a bit I'm going to look back at that and say God provided in that moment so as we stand together and sing in a moment that's my invitation to you is to actually write down a moment when God has been faithful what is that Ebenezer Of course, if there's something you'd like to pray about, I'll be down front and would love to pray with you. If you're hearing all of this idea about trust and you're like, you know what? I I don't know that I've ever actually trusted the Lord with my life. Well, I invite you to do that as well. But let's respond in whatever way God is leading. So I'm going to pray for us. We'll stand together. We'll sing this song. I'll be down front. But let's use this as a moment to remember God's faithfulness. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for the way that you've provided in our lives. God, even the way you're providing right now at this moment, this exact time, 
uh, this season of our church, this season of our lives. God, even the fact that we're here today, we know that you've given us our daily bread enough to bring us to this moment. You are providing over and over again. You have been faithful. So God, we're not asking you to do something new. Instead, may our eyes be open. May our hearts remember what you have done. And God, may we trust you, not with, with a halfway trust, not with just an interest, but God, wholly, completely, may we be committed to you above anything else that could compete for our attention. And we place our trust fully and absolutely in you. And we do that because of the one who lived, who died, who was resurrected, who ascended to heaven and sits at your right hand. We do that because of your son, Jesus. Amen. My friends, let's stand together. Let's sing. Respond as God leads. Come down, found a heavy blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melody song, song my fame in tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, Mount of I redeeming seal them. May we place our trust in him. My friends, I hope you have that moment. I hope that you can raise up an Ebenezer, a remembrance of God's faithfulness in your life. And I hope that when this week trust is hard to come by, you can look to that and remember God has helped me. God has been faithful and he will continue to be faithful. It's been so great to worship with you today. We'll have our join a team uh, iPad back there. We'd love to answer any questions about that. Jordan will be around. He can tell you about youth. Abby can tell you about hospitality. I'd be glad to tell you about kids. You can go talk to any of our people over there. But we hope that you will consider that opportunity to use the gifts God has given you to serve. At Third Coast Church, we never dismiss you. We always send you out into the world to do all that God has called you to do. And with that, my friends, you are sent. Have a blessed Sunday.